So I've driven the car almost 400 miles so far, and the channel members actually get to vote on what my next video is going to be about, and I have a lot of videos planned for this vehicle and the ownership experience and all that, but maybe they're trolling me for some reason, but I appreciate the support. They voted for me to talk about things I don't like first, so maybe it's just like ripping off the band-aid, let's just get it over with and admit that, yes, I've been saying a lot of positive things about Tesla, and I've been saying how much I love this car and how much I enjoy it that maybe it's good to also have a dose of reality and just say that, you know what, no car is perfect. All cars have their own little quirks and features. And now that I've had the car for almost a week, I've already found some things that aren't quite to my liking. I still overall love the vehicle, and over time, some of these things may change. I'll do update videos as time goes by. But yeah, in today's video, we'll be diving into basically 15 things that I don't really like about this car, but still no regrets at the end of the day. I'm still a fanboy and I'm still a shareholder. So I also ranked these items kind of in order of noticeability, things that I picked up on like as soon as I got in the car. And as I go down the list, it gets a bit more petty. But the first thing I noticed when I first sat down is just the visibility of both the mirrors and the glass. And maybe we were just spoiled with our Sonata, but our Sonata has very, very large mirrors and you can see a lot of what's going on behind you. Plus the rear windshield is quite big in the Sonata as well. And the Model 3 kind of has this sloping design out the back so the rear glass is not super easy to see out of no matter how many ways I adjust the rear view mirror same kind of story with the side view mirrors they're just overall much much smaller and they have a lot of excess padding kind of around them this probably helps with efficiency and that likely helps with better range and I'm sure if Tesla could they would probably want to get rid of the mirrors anyway and I know you're supposed to fall back more on using the display for your blind spots and for backing up but I've already ran into a lot of situations particularly when backing into my driveway at home that the sun can hit the screen in just the right way, yes, even with the screen protector, that it's kind of hard to get visuals on the display of exactly what you're looking at. So it takes some getting used to, but yesterday to pick up the car from the service center, I had to drive the Sonata again and I just kind of was surprised by, wow, I can actually see a lot better out of my old car. So hopefully I can just get better at using the cameras for more and more things. But yeah, I would almost rather not have mirrors at all and instead go all in on the camera cameras rather than have tiny mirrors that can't really capture all that many visuals and I noticed the same thing when I test drove the Model Y. I think they have the same size mirrors. The second thing we noticed as soon as we got inside the car because we're hydro buddies, me and my wife are always packing around big water bottles is that the cup holders are pretty dang small. Yeah, we basically had a Better Call Saul moment where we finally got the car of our dreams and then as soon as we tried to put our drink down it's like, oh, uh, okay that doesn't fit. They did just barely fit in the cup holders in our old car it's a small detail and maybe there's a way you can rip this whole thing apart and install new ones and yes we even tried to put our drink in the pocket doors they don't fit in those either so it's just a minor annoyance but it's something I think could be bigger there's clearly room for bigger cup holders if they wanted to put them there but eh. the other thing that I've definitely seen a lot of people bring up before is the no uh, accessibility handle some people call them the oh shoot handles for lack of a better word but while I don't particularly use them my wife liked to use them in our old car and we often are giving rides to our grandparents or just older people in general that when they kind of have to slope down in this lower car having a handle there to help them get in and get out is very very useful and I would almost argue it makes more sense on the Model 3 than it does the Model Y because it is definitely a bit harder to get into this car than it is the Model Y and I'm sure manufacturing efficiency wise it's probably much simpler to not have to put anything there I get it and I support it because Tesla Tesla's ramping up as quickly as possible, so I understand the reason they didn't put them on there, but as a consumer and just looking at it as a product, it feels like kind of a basic thing that could easily be there and something that people notice as soon as they get in the car. They go, wow, this is real. Oh, th there's nothing to grab onto here, especially for the older generations, which we still are driving around a lot, and we love taking older people in our Teslas because they've seen cars change a lot in their lifetime, so they love riding in the future of transport, which I think is Tesla. Something else we've picked up on just after a couple days of ownership is the air conditioning. You know, it's really nice that you can turn it on from your phone and you can kind of leave the car AC running even as you run away and the door locks and everything. So dog mode is great even if you don't have dogs. But something I even read in the owner's manual is that if you're in a hot environment and the car is directly in the sun, it will divert, I guess, a lot of the air conditioning towards managing the battery temperature because they don't want the battery to overheat, obviously. And 
and that will result in the cabin air conditioning not always being that cool. So sometimes we get in the car after it's been in the sun for a while and we start driving around and we're like, this is just not really getting that cold. We mess around with settings, you know, we set the temperatures and it just takes a while for it to actually get the temperature down. And because we've had so many air conditioning issues with our old car, we kind of kept daydreaming about, oh, we're going to get to pre-cool the car and that's going to be so much better. Now we finally got the car and it's like, man, our old car could actually get colder a little bit faster faster than this car but luckily we have a garage that can keep the car in the shade so most of the time this isn't really an issue it's only noticeable when we go out and get groceries and stuff like that but we do live in a very hot climate later this week it's going to be 111 degrees fahrenheit so the ac not getting super cold right away does kind of bug us a bunch but our rear passengers still prefer the car a lot more because our old sonata did not have any air conditioning vents that reached the back whereas this car at least does have ac right behind the armrest so the people in the back seat get to cool down a bit faster maybe that's why it doesn't cool as much is because it has to pump air through more of the vehicle than our old car i don't know but i've read it might have something to do with the heat pump which is a more efficient hvac system but technically you get a little bit worse performance in how quickly it can get cold ultimately tesla probably prioritized the efficiency because that means they can increase your range or use fewer cells in the vehicle and ramp faster so once again i get it i'm not in favor of switching my car to an older Model 3 that doesn't have the heat pump just because the AC will get colder faster. That wouldn't be worth it, but it's just a little thing we noticed. Something else that I knew about getting into the vehicle, but now that I've had experience with it is kind of annoying, is basically this whole process of getting in and out of the car. The doors are weird and they're different, okay? And I actually like that. You know, Tesla has such brand power, and when people come up to the car, we've shown it off to a bunch of family and friends, and they're like, how do I get in? And the door handle's weird and that's fine. I don't even personally mind having the button that you just have to push and push on the door. I think that's very simple and intuitive and I don't have any issues with that, but what does feel a little bit weird is the manual override, if the car does lose power, feels a little bit clunky. You're not supposed to use it, but I had a friend get in here and because he'd never sat in any Tesla before, he was ready to get out. He didn't know you're supposed to push the button and I guess I should have explained that, but he goes ahead and pulls on the manual release and of course the car is like, hey, don't do manual release. That could damage the trim. And that kind of ties me into another weird complaint about the car, which is the glass not really being part of an overarching frame. This probably helps with manufacturing efficiency or it's likely cheaper or something. There may be some benefits I don't know about, but this whole process of the windows having to go down and then back up when you close the door feels like too much extra moving parts. It's like making the windows do more work than they need to. And it also just creates this extra extra layer of paranoia whenever I'm getting in the car of like, I hope the window does what it's supposed to do. And you keep hearing this and the manual override of course is important for emergencies, but knowing that in an emergency, the car could literally damage itself with the trim feels kind of dumb. I don't know how much more complicated or how much more expensive it would be for the cars to just have a little frame around the glass. That's what our old Sonata had. And that was a pretty cheap car. Maybe it hurts the efficiency or something. I'm sure I'm going to get 50 comments on this video explaining why I'm wrong, but something that really bothered my wife in particular is the fact that the rear doors do not have a manual override at all, and sometimes we got passengers in the car, you know, and if there was an emergency and either the car caught on fire, even though that's incredibly unlikely due to lithium iron phosphate and everything, you know, safety is all about redundancy. It's about having backups. So if the car lost power for whatever reason and people in the back seat couldn't get out because there's no manual will override and they have to climb through here on the way out like that could potentially be a big problem now i know the likelihood of that emergency happening is very low and again that doesn't make me regret the whole purchase i'm still very happy with the car but it feels like something that there could be a bit of redundancy for and i know on other more expensive teslas there are manual overrides beneath the seats but even if you wanted your rear seat passengers to crawl out the windows for instance the rear windows don't go down all the way which also probably Probably is something to do with manufacturing efficiency. Maybe it's cheaper to not have the windows roll down that far in the back, but I've never bought a new car before and any vehicle I've seen in this price range doesn't have weird limiting like roll down of the back windows like that. It feels like cutting corners, but hey, I don't exactly know how much money they save by not letting the windows go down all the way, but it's just something I notice and something that leaves usually the rear seat passengers wanting a little bit more. You know, when people are first in the car, they're amazed, they're in a test. Tesla, 
oh my god this is so cool and you want to roll down the window and then it just stops halfway and they're like oh is it broken like what's wrong with your window and you just have to be like no nah, sorry that's just how far down it goes and they go oh Huh, uh, okay, weird. Not a big deal, but just something that kind of annoys me. Now, I'm in love with the self-opening trunk. That's something I really, really wanted on the Model 3 back when I first test drove one years ago, and I was like, please, Tesla, you gotta add an opening trunk that doesn't need to be lifted, and you don't have to shut it. That would be so much more futuristic and cool, and I'm glad they added that, but something that still bugs me, and now that we've bought the car, I know that I'm probably not going to get this unless I go aftermarket. I really wish the frunk could open itself. Like, not not only does the frunk need to be manually lifted and manually closed, it's also kind of violent. Like, you go on the app or you go here on the Tesla display and you just hit open, but it makes this sound that almost doesn't sound like the car's supposed to do it. It sounds like it's braking. Basically, the frunk just goes gunk, gunk and makes this really jarring noise that isn't pleasant. And then after that, you have to lift it up. And the frunk itself is nice to have. I've never had one before. And again, it's not a huge amount of storage space, but it's just nice to have a little bit of bonus storage. But then after that, you know, there's the special Tesla way to close the frunk. You got to be gentle with it. You, you can't slam it. It's one of those little quirks that you just got to get to know the car a little bit better. So I'm always explaining to my wife and anybody else that's getting in the car. Like, if you want to use the frunk, you gotta be gentle. You gotta push just a little bit on the front. And usually they're like, okay, we get it. You pay a lot of money for this car, so... I would love it if it just more gracefully opened like the trunk does. If I could just hit a button and then it lifts up. And yes, I'm aware. There's aftermarket accessories that support that. You can install that after the fact. And I'm not sure if I'm willing to drop the money on that feature alone. I'm just saying, for the car costing what it costs, it should have that by default. I don't think that should be an aftermarket thing. For the same reason... Reason, I didn't think the self-opening trunk should be an aftermarket accessory, even though it was. As far as the software on the screen goes, like, I love sentry mode. It's so helpful to be able to record what's going on around inside the car, and I actually just parked at a friend's house, and I saw the sentry mode incident, and I found out that my friend's dad was, like, checking out the car. He was looking in the windows and everything, and he didn't tell me he was looking at it, but it's just a really fun feature, but one complaint I have with sentry mode is it's kind of buggy. For one, it records 10 minutes for any tiny incident, even if someone walked by the car for like five seconds, it records 10 minutes that went on around that incident. Does it need to be 10 minutes? Did Tesla ask people how long it should record for and that's what they said? I don't know, but it seems like way longer than it needs to be and also even when you're just playing back the footage, the playhead will jump around and that's what the internal like installed flash drive that they put in the glove box. I've got a new one made by Pure Tesla that we'll talk about in another video. Maybe after I install that, Sentry mode will work more reliably. I'm not sure, but at least in its current state, you know, just the way they intend you to use it out of the factory, it feels kind of buggy. And, you know, if someone was actually vandalizing the vehicle or damaging it in any sort of way, that would really bother me. If I was like trying to find the clip of the vandalism taking place, but because the flash drive didn't write the file properly, the playhead is just jumping around and I can't actually get the footage I need. So it could become a major problem in the future. Right now, though, it's just a minor annoyance. But while we're on the subject of software, I feel like I should also bring up Autopilot. So no, I don't have full self-driving right now. I plan on subscribing to it in just a couple of days. I'll do a video on that, but I love having Autopilot on the freeway, and it's so nice to have adaptive cruise control, which I think I completely underrated in my videos. Even if you're not steering the car, just having it slow down and speed up when you're in traffic and stuff is immensely helpful. But when I'm using Autopilot on a lot of rural back roads, because I live in a pretty rural area, it still can be pretty dang stupid. I mean, like, it wants to just be equally centered in the middle of two lines on the road. In a lot of places I drive, there's not always two lines on the road, so it's going way out further from the yellow line than it should, and oftentimes there's a lot of street parking where I live, and there's cars parked on the street, and it doesn't want to get over. It still will narrowly shave right by those parked cars, even though there's plenty of room for it to just move over. You know, when I was in driving school, I was taught to be always, like, two feet away from the yellow line. Sure, if there's oncoming traffic, or like a big truck or something, you can move on a little bit, but Autopilot doesn't quite have the context yet like FSD Beta does to like, hey, move over if there's cars there. Or maybe this is a resolution problem. I'm not sure. I'm going to say that it's just a software related thing, but Autopilot will be going really fast when there's clearly a stop ahead. There's a red light, and I know it's not trained to stop at red lights, but there's cars stopped at the stoplight, which it's trained to see those other cars, and it should be slowing down. That's what Autopilot 
pilot in adaptive cruise control are supposed to do and it doesn't stop soon enough even this morning i was using it and i was like okay we were only going like 40 miles per hour so we were not on the freeway but there's a uh, stopped cars ahead and it was still going still going and i was like are you gonna stop and instead of actually just gradually and gracefully slowing to a stop and instead just panicked and screams at me and goes doo -doo 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 -doo. you gotta hit the brake like take over now and it's like okay if you don't know what to do like why don't you just come down to a stop instead of scream at me you know interrupt my music and there's been times where like it dinged my safety score because a pedestrian was crossing a road but i wasn't even planning on going down that road like i was driving by my grandparents house and the road kind of splits and again the lines out there are not very well marked so i'm just driving and i'm gonna take the right turn there's a guy crossing the road on the left turn and because it sees me kind of going towards him even though i'm on my side of the road and i was not heading in his direction at all i get the forward collision warning and it screams at me and it's like ah take over now you're gonna hit this guy and it's like okay tesla i know you think you're smart and i know you're trying to protect me but i was not heading that way before i have driven on those roads like millions of times i was only going like 25 miles an hour i wasn't even going fast and we had people in the car and it was kind of early in the morning and we had just gotten it so they were like wow this is really cool and then just to have the car scream at you in the first like five minutes of driving kind of puts a sour taste in everyone's mouth they're like huh well that's stupid and i kind of agree and i'm willing to excuse a lot of autopilot stupidity because i understand that a lot of the software attention from tesla is all going towards fsd beta right now but i think it's quite obvious that they have not updated or touched the basic free autopilot code rightfully so because it makes them no money because that's included with the car but all i'm trying to say is it shows and one of my favorite features about autopilot is that it doesn't have to be on the highway you can use it on back roads you can use it in in residential areas. No, I don't want super cruise. No, I don't want any other driver assistance feature because I like the concept that I can turn it on basically anywhere. I just wish that they could take some of that FSD beta code and bring it to autopilot so that autopilot performs better, but maybe it's in Tesla's best interest to not improve autopilot so that people want to spend more on FSD. Maybe that's their logic, but on the subject of the alert screaming at you and the forward collision warnings, I also wish you could change the sounds that autopilot and those emergency warnings make because they're still way too loud. Like, I turned on Joe mode because Joe mode is supposed to make the sounds quieter, but I don't like having any kind of notification sound. Like, my phone is on silent at all times. My watch doesn't make any noises. When I get texts on any device, I always have it set to silent because I don't like those big notification noises. I think they're disruptive and distracting. So if it's not an emergency, I wish you could just turn those sounds off entirely. Like, when I turn on autopilot, I'm paying attention, right? I'm looking at the road. I can see that it's activated. I don't need those sounds every single time to go boom, 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 boom. You know, I'm checking my speed, so my eyes are at the screen anyway, and it's really quite obvious when autopilot has been deactivated for me. Even if you can't turn off the sounds entirely, if you could just make them like 20% the volume of Joe mode, that would be better for me. And even those emergency situations, I wish there was something else they could do to notify you than just blare all the speakers and make this really panicky sound, which upsets that's everyone in the car like maybe you can tighten the seat belt a little bit or maybe if the seat vibrated i know some cars do that or some more silent and non-intrusive way to notify you hey you better take over or you better hit the brake just it's too loud i don't like all these notification sounds and as my wife experienced in our last video she doesn't really like the process of having to apply torque to the vehicle to let you know you're paying attention because she often deactivated autopilot and yes i saw your comments i know that you can adjust the scroll wheel or push down on the gear stock to let it know that you're still paying attention but that still just feels overly naggy because like okay your hands are off the wheel 30 seconds go by now i gotta touch this uh, 30 seconds go by now i gotta touch this i've actually found it more comforting and relaxing to just leave my hand there but the fact that you can deactivate autopilot by turning the wheel too much but also to keep autopilot working you have to turn the wheel a little too much it's not a capacitive wheel which i think would make it a lot better if it just could detect when a hand is on it but that's not enough you can't just leave your hands on the wheel you have to also apply a little bit of force but not too much force and personally i think it would just be way better if it was eye tracking there is a camera up here and i know it can see the driver's eyes tesla is probably just being extra safe for liability reasons but it would be so much more futuristic and so much more relaxing if it could just look at your eyes and make sure you're paying attention to the road okay maybe it doesn't work with sunglasses but i just won't wear sunglasses then that's fine i'm just personally not a huge fan of the apply rotation to the steering wheel thing because 
because it's so finicky and again it got turned off when my wife was driving unintentionally like several times in a row she had a hard time finding that sweet spot but coming away from the software for a second just looking at the car as a whole one thing i didn't quite like about this car is the price you know it's nice that there was no dealer markups or anything but this car definitely has gone up a lot and it's even gone up since we've ordered it by a couple grand but basically after taxes and fees and everything it was over fifty thousand dollars and it definitely feels a bit weird saying that you know once you hit the 50k mark is just a ugh, sound in your brain especially when it's a car this small you know it's not even a full-size sedan it's pretty compact and you know most of the time when you look at cars like this you don't think fifty thousand dollars because it doesn't have super high-end luxury features you're absolutely paying for things that i still think are worth it you know like i love the software i love the battery i love the charging tech and i love that i can control so much from my phone but still the fact that a couple years ago they were actually able to sell the model 3 for around 35k if you wanted standard range plus that was like 37 38k and it's come up a lot and that's just a simple law of supply and demand so as a shareholder i'm grateful for the higher profit margin but as a customer now i feel like man they could probably have sold this for a lot less and they would have been fine but tesla can get away with it because at the end of the day as expensive as it is i'm not going to say it's overpriced because i still think it's worth it and i'm still enjoying the car but would i have liked to have paid less absolutely would have been great if it was much cheaper especially considering the lack of communication because that's another complaint i have it was very unclear leading up to delivery what the car would come with so i ordered my car on march 2nd and at that time the mobile connector was included and we didn't think anything of it and then end of april rolled around and tesla said they're not going to include the mobile connector for orders that took place after april 26th so i thought to myself i must be good because my car was ordered before then then after i got my vin Tesla sent me an email saying, here's a promo code for the Tesla shop so that you can get a mobile connector for free. And I was like, wait a minute, why are they sending me this email? So I contacted my support agent and I was like, is my car coming with a mobile connector or not? And he said, no, it is because you ordered before April 26th. And I told him, okay, it's just, I got this email with the promo code. And he said, oh, well, if you got that email, then you're not getting the mobile connector. And I guess you better order one soon. So I ordered it as quickly as possible after he told me that, but there was a lot of confusion there where I was like, is it coming with one or not? And because back when we ordered the car, we were told that it would have a mobile connector, but at home we have a NEMA 1450 outlet installed, which back when I ordered the car, they didn't come with those outlets. So I ordered the Tesla adapter for the NEMA 1450 so that once I got the car with the mobile connector, I could charge it pretty quickly from my house. Then they said, no, you got to get the promo code, which covers the cost of the mobile connector. So I got the promo code. I ordered the mobile connector and it luckily arrived two days before I took delivery once I got the mobile connector it already had a NEMA 1450 adapter in it they included it for free with that purchase so basically I bought like a $45 adapter for no reason which felt stupid I guess I'll just try to sell it or find someone who needs it but yeah I just have two NEMA mobile connectors simply because Tesla couldn't make up their mind on what is and isn't included with the car which felt dumb lastly is a little note I'll mention for auto high beams which which I'd heard a lot about because this car does have the Matrix LED headlights, which is awesome. And I've heard people say that, you know, you don't have to adjust the lights because when there's a car coming, it switches to low beams. And then when a car leaves, it switches to high beams. And I tried to use it, but it just takes way too long to change. And I feel bad for the oncoming traffic. So a car will come around the corner and the high beams are still on. So they stay on for a while and then they finally switch. But you can tell that the other car is already annoyed. They're flashing at you. So I basically just don't use high beams at all i rarely use them on the sonata and the low beams are still insanely bright on this car like i can see so much better than i can on my old car but i wish those auto high beams could pick up and switch once another car is coming a lot faster i feel like it has a fairly capable processor and the frame rate on the cameras is pretty good it shouldn't be that hard to switch to low beams and it still takes like three to four seconds for it to update which is too long when there's people coming at you they're like oh my god i can't see so those are the 15 things i don't really like and i hope they can change some of those with the software updates there is a few things that aren't really complaints but they're just things we would like to see in the future obviously we can't add too much hardware to the vehicle but my 
My wife would like more customization on the display. She really liked having the odometer always accessible and you can't really put the odometer just on the display to always be seen. You have to go into settings to look at how many miles you have on the car. So my wife would appreciate having more data and have more control over the screen, which could come in an update. So that's something she would like. My biggest request, which is probably a controversial one, and I understand why Tesla probably isn't doing this, but I'm a big fan of the yoke steering wheel. And even though there's no driver display in the car, I love this design because of how clean and minimal it is. It's so simplistic. So I wish Tesla could take it a step further and bring over what they've done with the Model S and X. I would love to have a yoke and I would love them to ditch the gear stocks and just have buttons on the yoke. And for changing your direction, you just fall back on the display. I think they could very easily bring that to the Model 3 and Y and the interior would look even cleaner. You wouldn't have the big steering wheel loop covering your vision more than it needs to. And you wouldn't have these extra gear stocks on the side. I love controlling the car via the display. So I wouldn't mind if they brought that over from the Model S and X, but just for the record, my wife doesn't like that. She prefers the full steering wheel. She does not like the yoke. And a lot of you guys out there probably agree with my wife. So I understand why Tesla does that. But at the same time, I'm just saying if at checkout, they had an option that said, do you want a yoke or do you want a steering wheel with gear stocks? I'd be the guy that picks the yoke. In fact, I might even pay extra for it, but not that much. I'd also appreciate some better technology because I'm obviously a tech guy. I'm not a car enthusiast or anything. That's kind of why I love Tesla is they're like bringing the tech era to the automotive market. And as great as the tech is in this car, it's probably better than any other car in this price bracket. I still still would like it to go a few steps further to kind of catch up with the hardware that I have with my Apple computers and tablets. So I would like 120 hertz on the display. I know I'm nitpicking at this point, but I love having 120 hertz refresh rate on my laptop, on my phone, on my iPad. It's just an extra way to make the display more responsive and extra buttery. And I think all 120 hertz displays look super clean. This one's 60 hertz. And I know that that doesn't sound like a big deal, but when I'm buying a car and I'm planning on keeping it for potentially decades, that 60 hertz is just going to start to feel slower and laggier and laggier. So if you're buying a car and planning to own it for a long time, it should have the best possible tech in it. I would appreciate thinner bezels as well. The bezels on this display are a little bit big compared to what I have on my TV, my phone, or my laptop. So having a more immersive display would be good. And also because of that longevity argument, I would appreciate 5G. There's no 5G connectivity in this car. Not that I necessarily think you need 5G speeds. It's actually just about in the future, there's a good chance that carriers will start discontinuing 4G. And in fact, a lot of earlier Tesla owners from like 2012 and 2013, those cars just had 3G modems and they didn't have 4G. And now carriers are shutting down 3G networks. So those cars need to be retrofitted. You have to update the internals so that they can support those newer connectivity features. And I know that in the future, probably at some point in the next 10 years, 4G is going to start being turned off and I'm going to either have to pay for a retrofit or rely more on my phone's hotspot in the future. Whereas if they would have just put 5G in now, they would have saved themselves a lot of work down the road. This is also a minor thing, but I've also really gotten comfortable with MagSafe chargers with my phone, just the little magnetic ring that slaps to the back and lets you know when you're charging. This has wireless charging, which is awesome and it's in a very convenient place, but it's a little bit below the Tesla display, which makes it a little bit hard to see your phone screen sometimes. And also because it doesn't have MagSafe on those wireless chargers, you kind of have to align your phone just right. If it gets pushed too much to the left or right, it won't charge. So if they just added little MagSafe rings, you would get that extra security when docking to the phone. I'm only bringing up these little details because I brought them up in the past back when I test drove the car in like 2019 and Tesla ended up adding a lot of the things I was asking for. Like I really wanted more USB-C ports and they added that. I really wanted the self-opening trunk and they added that. And I wanted a more responsive, snappier display and they gave it AMD Ryzen chips, so it got better at that. I wanted them to ditch the piano black center console and they ditched that. So that's why I bring up these things is because I think there's a chance they might add them if we ask for it enough. Similarly, the last thing I'll request is the enhanced version of CarPlay, which I know Tesla has said they don't want to add. I'm not saying it has to take over the entire display. Tesla can still have control over that left column where you have your visualizations and your speed and everything, but just being able to use Apple Maps or Apple Music or your 
our iMessage features and all that on the rest of the display, I think a lot of people would appreciate. And even if you don't want to use CarPlay, at least putting AirPlay on the car, because a lot of third-party hardware supports AirPlay now, like Roku TVs do this, it would allow us to just cast things from our phone onto the display, which would be much better than waiting around for Tesla to finally add support for your streaming apps on Tesla Theater, because, you know, I love that it's there, and I love watching YouTube in the car, but all they have is Netflix, Disney+, Plus, and Hulu, and TikTok, which I don't really use any of those other ones, but I do use Peacock, I use Paramount+, Plus, I use Discovery+, Plus, but I can't easily access those. I can try to go through the browser, but a lot of the time it doesn't want to play the content, and I can't full screen the content when I'm watching it, so if you just supported AirPlay when in theater mode or whatever, you could cast whatever streaming app you have on your phone onto the car, and that would be much faster than waiting for Tesla to integrate the support for all of those streaming apps into the theater. So, okay, now you guys know I'm not a complete and utter fanboy. I ranted for quite a while about things I don't like about the car, but overall, as time goes on, you guys will discover there's still a lot of things I love and that I'm enjoying and still discovering. What things do you guys not like about the Model 3 or your Tesla in general? Feel free to let me know down below. And thank you to all of our very generous Patreon supporting this channel directly. It seriously helps us out a ton, as does just watching these videos. So thanks again. Have an excellent rest of your day.